Linux installation. So we're going to talk about CentOS. CentOS is based on the source code of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, RHEL. The CentOS distribution is community-based and it does get some support from Red Hat in the form of paid developers. Red Hat pays for Red Hat developers, they also pay for Fedora developers, and they also pay for CentOS, some of the CentOS developers. So where does it fit in in the distribution families? There are a couple of different major sources of, well, Linux distributions. You've got the source code based Linux distributions that would include things like Slackware, which is one of the oldest. You have Gentoo and Arch, and even Android's kind of a, a source code based Linux distribution. Then you have the whole Red Hat family. Red Hat family includes Fedora, which is kind of their development suite. You have CentOS, which is a version of Red Hat with a lot of the proprietary stuff and branding removed. There is Oracle, which is basically the same thing as CentOS, except it's uh, paid for by the Oracle company there. Red Flag, which is the uh, Linux distribution put out by China. And then there's also things like OpenSUSE. So these are all in the Red Hat family. So they all have a they all have a lot of similarities. They all have the same Red Hat package management system. So you can identify them that way. Then there is the Debian family. The Debian family would include the well Debian, but you also have Ubuntu and Mint. Um, basically, you have Debian, and some people thought, well, it's kind of complex, so let's make it a little better. And so then you have Ubuntu which based off that, then they decided, well, that's a little bit too complex, so they added a little bit more. They gave some more proprietary drivers. You got Mint. And then you have other distributions, such as Kali, which is your penetration testing distribution, which also is based off of the Debian family, probably based off of Ubuntu, most directly. All right, when you're doing an installation, the first thing that you come across is you have the Anaconda installer. So Anaconda is just the name of the installer, but Red Hat based Linux distributions such as CentOS Linux use Anaconda as the installer. So you'll find that a lot of these distributions have an installation wizard that looks the same. That's Anaconda. Anaconda is an installer written in Python. It's got some C parts as well. But it is responsible for making sure the operating system is correctly applied to the machine put in place. You have the bootloaders and everything else in place, and it boots up. Anaconda works great some of the time. Sometimes it fails. It fails, well, a lot more than the actual Linux distribution will fail when it's running. So you got to be careful with that. Sometimes you have to start over, but that's usually okay. When you're in Anaconda, you have to configure networking. You need to make sure you configure a host name for the machine. Every machine should have its own host name. Don't stay with local host. Make sure you have a host name. You want to make sure the machine has either DHCP or static manual addresses configured. You can go in there and configure it up. Make sure you have a set. If you do DHCP, you have to make sure that you have a DHCP server in the network it's going to be residing in. If it is not doing DHCP, then you need to make sure you configure all the important parts of static or manual address configuration. You need an IP address, you need a mask, you need to have a gateway, and you need to have a DNS server. Also, after you configure the networking, you want to make sure you activate the interface so that it will come up when you start. You want to make sure you configure the date and time. Well, it's not really date and time you configure, it's more setting the time zone. That's kind of the important thing. You want to make sure the time zone is set. And it's best to set your time zone after you've already configured networking. So it'll automatically decide that you have networking and it will use network time. Network time provides the NTP protocol or the network time protocol to allow it to synchronize with time servers and get updates automatically. Normally it saves the time on your machine as UTC time basically the Greenwich Mean Time or Zulu Time. Windows, on the other hand, stores it as local time, so what's written to the hardware might be different for Windows and Linux, and that can cause problems sometimes. 
if you have a dual boot machine or a machine that uses both operating systems. Software selection. You want to make sure you select which software needs to be installed. So when you are starting, the easiest thing to do is to select the GNOME desktop. GNOME desktop will give you all the essentials and get you a GUI so you can have this clicking ability and the ability to do, well, easier things. However, Linux was designed mostly to be run without a GUI. Um, GUI has been built afterwards and they're, they're nice and they can be very pretty, but you don't really want a GUI if you're running a server. So and in a production environment, you want to start with a minimal install and just add the features you need and not have everything else because there are security issues if you have too much. Any software you miss during the installation can be added after as long as it's not something like network drivers because you need the network. Installation destination. So Anaconda can automatically create partitions for you or you can create them manually yourself. So there are two main kinds of partitions you'll see. You can see the standard partitions you can create. Those are your normal fixed length partitions with older style device names, things like slash dev slash SDA1, which you don't need to worry about. Or you can use the LVM partitions. LVM partitions basically creates this giant, well, Linux volume management partition. And that partition is kind of a standard partition. And then within that, you create these blocks that you can then use. And that's that allows you to be more flexible resizing and adding things and allowing you to span multiple drives much easier when you are configuring your partitions there are lots of different directories you can consider to have as separate partitions normally you want to have a root partition which is the slash you want to have your partition for virtual memory which is your swap and you also want to have a partition for the bootloader, the slash boot. That also includes things like the kernel and initial RAM disk. So those three are your general three you have. Sometimes you add more. The var directory contains logs, and sometimes you can have problems if your logs fill up and it takes down your entire server. So some people put it as a separate partition to prevent that from happening. When you are done and you start the installation process, you are then given the option to create users. The main user for the system is called root. So root needs to have a password, needs to be nice and secure. The root user has all power as far as the users go on the system and can do many, many damaging, destructive things. You can also have additional users and additional users are very good to run on the system because they don't have all power, which means that if they make mistakes, they don't necessarily cause as much problems. These users could also be administrative users. So what happens is if you click the checkbox to make it an administrative user, it will add the user to the wheel group. So there are groups, and the wheel group allows members to run commands as root using the sudo command. So you type sudo, space the name of the command. It will then usually prompt you for the user's password and then after that they can run the commands as root. When you are done with the installation sometimes you see a license agreement portion. If you're doing minimal install you don't necessarily see it. Sometimes you do. But you need to be aware that Linux comes with a license like any other operating system. It comes with a license. And most of the stuff most of the packages you get on Linux are distributed under a free software or open source license. Free software licenses require all derivative works be distributed with a similar license. So if you have access to modify it, then this derivative license means that anybody else, when you redistribute it, has the same rights you received. So you have to provide those same rights. Open source licenses allow you to see and modify the code, and that's basically what they do. Now, free software licenses are a special type of open source license, slightly more restrictive, but it makes for 
more security of the source code in the long run. Once you have your system up and going, you should probably update it. Most Linux installation disks are not absolutely new, and there are updates that, well, need to be applied. So the first thing you should consider doing is updating your updating system, updating software. So you can type in yum update yum. Yum is your updater, so you want to update yum first. Now after that, something you need to keep in mind is that there might be updates that include, well, packages with libraries that are part of your GUI. And you do not want to update your GUI from within, side, from within your GUI, so you want to make sure you get out of it. You can press the Control-Alt-F2 key sequence to drop into a terminal back place where you can type in commands and not be inside of the GUI. You can also press Control-Alt-F1 to switch back into the GUI. On older versions of Linux or other versions of Linux, sometimes it's Control-Alt-F6 or Control-Alt-F7 to get into your GUI. Just make sure you try a few, you'll figure it out. Once you are outside of your GUI, you want to update your system. So I recommend you don't even log into your GUI until your system is fully updated. But just type in yum update and that will update your system. And that is it for this lecture.